What if I told you that your computer was being controlled by someone else without your knowledge? What if I told you that it was being used to send millions of malicious emails that would lead to others losing control of their devices? And what if I told you that this was happening even if you believed you had full control of your computer, no one else had access to it, and you're using it on a daily basis? Although it may not be your computer, it's true for millions of computers that have been taken over and have become zombies. In order to understand what a zombie is, we can use the matrix as a parable. When we first meet Neo, he seems to be in full control of his body, and for the most part, his life. Later, we find out that this is not the reality, but that his body is located at a farm where it's being harvested for energy by robots. In the same way, a zombie looks to its owner like a regular computer. They think they're in full control of it. When in reality, it's taking commands from somewhere else and is a part of an army of bots that are being used for nefarious purposes. It's difficult to estimate how many bots there are in the world. Just trying to enumerate all the botnets in the world is difficult enough. However, there have been some attempts. For example, in 2014, the head of FBI cybersecurity division estimated that there were 500 million computers sorry, <laughs> added to a botnet each year, which makes 18 computers per second. There are over 4 billion internet users in the world using over 20 billion internet connected devices. So that would mean that there's one infected bot, and my slides are missing. Sorry. There's one infected bot for every internet user in the world. Another more conservative estimate is that there is one bot infection for every 65 internet users in Iceland. Every botnet has a master, the bot master. The bot master is a person who controls the botnet and gives it orders. And these orders go through the command and control servers. The command and control servers send orders to infected machines that are called bots or zombies. In the case of spamming botnets, these orders are the email messages the computer should send, along with a list of email addresses they should send them to and from. All right. <laughs> so why should I care if my computer is a zombie? Is it a problem? Well, to begin with, once your computer gets infected, it will be used to attack other internet users, especially your friends and family. People are more likely to open messages from someone they know, which is why it's common practice for botnets to use the contact list from infected machines and to send messages from the victim's account to their contacts. A bot infection can leave a backdoor open, allowing the botmaster to push new malware to the bots. This could, for example, be a keylogger, keeping track of everything you do on your machine and every password you type in, or ransomware that could encrypt your data and lead to you losing all of your data. The bot infection will also cause constant internet traffic from your computer, which will lead to high internet charges. 
your machine will also get slow because it's busy serving another master and doesn't have time to serve you. And finally, there might be some legal complications if your computer is used in a cyber attack. So while botnets persist, what can we do to minimize their threat? First, we must understand how they operate. And in order to do so, we decided to go undercover and infiltrate botnets. Infiltrating a botnet required us to set up our environment so that the bot botmaster saw nothing unusual about our bot. It just looked like any other zombie. When in fact, it's not. And it does not spread any malicious emails. Some of the bot's communication works like a regular bot's, but some of it is blocked. Uh, the reason some of it works as a regular bot's is so that it can make contact with the command and control server. But all the email traffic is redirected to another server where it can do no harm and where we could analyze it. Now, while a regular bot would obey the command and control server and send spam to new victims, our bot, all the traffic from our bot, was redirected to our databases where we could analyze it and none of it got out into the wild. Now let's have a look at two spamming botnets, Knackers and Emotet. Knackers was discovered in 2012. It's one of the largest and oldest spamming botnets that are still active. It has been responsible for much of the spam of last year's, even to the point where it was responsible for more than half of all spam. It was the biggest distributor of ransomware in 2016 and 2017, and is thought to include over one and a half million bots. Now, if we take a look at the number of malicious email attachments the Siren has detected in the past three years, we can see a trend that's dominated mostly by knackers. 2016 and 2017 were big years in ransomware, and that was spread using malicious email attachments. Now, if we look at 2016, it looks like the year starts off slowly, but as the year increases, uh, as the time passes, the volume increases. And we can see that Knackers released new versions of Locky ransomware uh, regularly, both in 2016 and 2017. And we can see the same trend in 2017, where the volume increases as the time passes. So we notice this gap at the first weeks of the year. It looks like the malware distributors take some time off, which fits nicely with the Russian holiday calendar. Now, if we look at 2018, it looks like nothing happened. Unfortunately, that does not mean that malware distribution has dropped. The methods have only changed. So instead of using uh, attachments, we now see the use of other techniques, like using URLs that lead to websites that will download malicious content. It's important for malware researchers to keep up with how malware and its delivery methods evolve. And being able to get the malware straight from the source facilitates that. So when Nacker started using a new delivery method last year, we were able to ca catch it from the beginning because we were monitoring a Nacker's bot. We'll have a closer look at that later. Here we have a histogram showing the email traffic from a Nacker's bot in December of 2018 and January of 2019. Notice that the bot has gone on vacation and not yet returned. This is regular for knackers and could go on for about three months, but then it will probably return with some new tricks. Now, we can use this data to estimate the number of emails Nacros could send in one day. 
On a, fairly regular, on a fairly slow day, when the bot was spamming, it was sent about 20,000 emails in a day. So if we multiply that with a number of bots, 1.5 million, we get 30 billion emails in one day. Now let's have a look at one of those emails. The email would look something like this. Here they imitate a banking advisor include some disclaimers to make it look legitimate, and then there's an attachment that's password protected. The reason I use passwords is to make automated sandbox detection more difficult. Now, if we fall for this, uh, we click the attachment and enter the password, this is what we'll see. It looks like an almost empty Excel sheet. Now, if we look at the file behind it, it looks like this. This is an internet query file. It's not commonly used, but in this case, they used it to download malicious content. So what's happening behind the scenes is that a PowerShell script is downloaded from the URL. The PowerShell script then downloaded an executable from another URL. And the executable, in turn, downloaded an encrypted binary file with a PNG extension. It's then converted to an executable that is, in fact, flawed ME, a remote access trojan, which allows hackers to have full control of your device. And what seemed like an almost empty Excel sheet gave someone complete access to your computer. Now let's have a look at the next botnet, Emotet. The Emotet malware was discovered in 2014. At first, it was only a banking trojan, but it was then expanded to have the ability to download other malware. The Emotet malware has several modules, one of which is a spamming module. And it uses that as one, is not, as one of its distribution methods. He uses mal spam from the bots. And once the malware has been executed on a machine, that machine becomes part of the Emotet botnet. Now the size of the botnet has been estimated to be at least a few hundred thousand IP addresses, which could be many more machines. The Emotet malware is polymorphic, meaning that once it finds a new victim, it can mutate. That makes it more difficult to detect. It also has sophisticated evasion techniques, and it can detect if it's being run in a sandbox environment, which is commonly used by malware researchers, and then it will lay dormant. Here we have a histogram showing the traffic from an Emotet bot in January of this year. This bot can send millions of emails in one day, whereas the Nacros bot would send tens or hundreds of thousands of emails in one day. The Emotet bot can send hundreds of thousands of emails in one hour and millions in a day. Now we can use this data to estimate how many emails Emotet can send in one day. So if we say that Emotet has at least uh, 400,000 bots, and that each bot will send about 3 million emails in a day, that makes 1.2 trillion emails in one day. And you may ask where all these emails are going to, because there are only 5.5 billion active email accounts in the world. But our data shows that the bot will send emails to the same email addresses several times a day. The reason for this is that the botnet has several campaigns going on at the same time. And it will send the same email, or it will send an email for each campaign to the same list of email addresses. Now let's have a look at an email from Emotet. This is an example of an email that's used to spread the Emotet malware. 
and grow the botnet. It's made to look like an invoice attached to an email. And the sender can't be spoofed and is often made to look like some company that people know, for example, Amazon. If we fall for their tricks and we go check what we owe, this is what we'll see. It looks like we need to enable editing and allow macros to be able to see the invoice. But if we do that, nothing changes, and we don't see an invoice. So what actually happens when we enable macros is that a macro is executed, and it starts cmd.exe, the command line. CMD runs a PowerShell script that tries to download an executable. And here we can see the PowerShell script. You can see that there are a few URLs here. And that for each of them, it tries to download an executable that will be called 726.exe. The executable will be downloaded to a temporary folder, but will then be moved to a different folder and run under a different process name. That process makes contact with a CNC server in Argentina, and your computer is now part of the Emotet botnet and is open to any number of malware that the malware distributor wishes to push onto it. Now we have seen examples of how spamming botnets work. And both of these botnets target Windows machines, which may lead us to believe that other devices are safe. Unfortunately, that's not true. And there are many types of botnets. There are, for example, botnets that target IoT devices, such as home routers, or Android devices, such as your phone, and your TV. One of these IoT botnets was the Mirai botnet. It was, for example, used in a DDoS attack of September 2016. The botnet sent a flood of requests to a DNS provider called DIN, which resulted and hundreds of websites and services being unavailable for several hours. Now, this included Twitter, GitHub, Netflix, Etsy, Pinterest, PayPal, and Airbnb. At first, it was believed that it took millions of devices to do this attack. But it was later found out that it only took 100,000 devices to cause all that damage. These devices were home routers, IP cameras, and baby monitors. And notice that these are the types of devices we often don't think of updating or changing usernames and passwords. And that's exactly what Mirai used to spread the botnet. It just had a list of commonly used usernames and passwords. No advanced hacking skills needed. When Mirai was at its largest, it included 300,000 devices. But the code form for Mirai was published online, which led to many other variants of it being developed, one of which was the Reaper botnet. Now, the Reaper didn't just spread using brute force attacks, but it used vulnerabilities in home routers, IP cameras, and digital network video recorders. Although the botnet only spread to a few hundred thousand devices, it had two million other devices queued up for infection, giving the botnet the potential to spread to over two million devices. It should be clear to us now that botnets are a real threat that we need to take seriously, which raises the question of what can be done to avoid infection. First of all, it's important to update our devices regularly. Security updates are there for a reason. Don't use default usernames and passwords. Change them and use strong passwords. 
If you receive a strange email, check who it's really from. And if you see a suspicious looking link, don't click it. In case you accidentally click and download something, antivirus is helpful and can prevent the malware from harming your computer. And if all the above fails, you can always just throw your computer away and use pen and paper. Thank you.